I want to greet the Deputy Vice Chancellors, Executive Deans of Faculties. I particularly want to greet the Executive Dean of Engineering, Built Environment and Technology, Professor Baron van Veek. I want to greet all the professors, uh, other academics, members of senior management, the president of the Alumni Association, the students, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, manene na manene gazi. It is a distinct pleasure for me to welcome you here this evening on the occasion of the inaugural lecture to be delivered by our colleague, Professor Russell Phillips. Professor Phillips, I want to thank you also for reminding us of the importance of acknowledging colleagues, family and friends who accompany and walk with us on life's journey to success. In this regard, I extend a special word of welcome and acknowledgement to the following colleagues. Uh, Professor Danny Harting, who was your promoter for your doctoral studies and a continued research mentor for many years. Uh, Professor Theo van Niekerk, a research collaborator and your mentor. Professor Carl Dupree, who as manager of the Advanced Mechatronic Technology Center, has facilitated funding and created a supportive environment to fast track the research. I want to mention on your behalf and on our behalf, uh, Dr. Ozzy Franks, whose support as the former dean and now from the Office of Strategic Resource Mobilization and Advancement has offered ongoing support to research projects. And the most special welcome is to Marita Phillips, your wife and lifelong companion, Professor. Allow me to congratulate you, my colleague, Professor Phillips, on your outstanding achievement. Being promoted to full professor is an, the ultimate recognition of your achievement as a scholar and a researcher. Your professorship is a pinnacle moment in your 30-year career of commitment to Nelson Mandela University and to your scholarship. Your journey of perpetual discovery is remarkable and serves as a sterling example of stepping from your grounding in mechanical engineering to extensive application in the arena of mechanical, marine, mechatronic engineering, as well as mechanotechnology. I need to be careful with that. You have further chosen to apply your knowledge and expertise with a deep consciousness of concern for sustainability of both natural resources and social endeavors with your dedicated focus on renewable energy. We thank you for that. Your scholarship has charted new ways of thinking about conundrums that the world is grappling with, particularly unlocking reliable, affordable, safe, and consistent energy supply available to each and every person, whether living in a rural community, similar to the villages that many of our students, your students, come from, or residing in a modern city globally, such as Tokyo or Tswane. In your research for innovative solution, you have accepted the challenge of a four of a forward-focused researcher to ask better and bolder questions continuously. You have co-traveled this journey with students at all levels, introducing them to the wonders of engineering as a social tool and inviting them to explore with you ways to devise better and more effective and efficient solutions to everyday living circumstances of communities and in the world of business. It is also with tremendous proud that we have seen you receive recognition in internally uh, for your teaching excellence and outstanding innovation track record, including numerous registered patents. The impact of your research, Professor Phillips, and scholarship has also reached well beyond the university through your vast network of international and, uh, and industrial collaborators, which I hope 
uh, all of them are with us this evening. Your inaugural lecture this evening stands as a shining beacon for us, demonstrating how one of your research outcomes, namely ways of providing affordable remote connectivity, is a direct manifestation of the university's commitment that of being service, of in service of society. Thank you for crossing new frontiers and taking us into unexplored domains, for making earth stewardship through sustainable energy solutions, demonstrable and real for us, and for changing lives through your engineering innovations. Congratulations again, Professor Phillips. I now request the Executive Dean of Engineering, Built Environment and Technology, Professor Ben Van Veek, to introduce Professor Philip. I thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, and go see Mazinetole. Thank you. Vice Chancellor, um, deans, professors, fellow academics, colleagues, students, and guests. Uh, I want to start by thanking Prof Mutwa for her opening remarks and paving the way for me to introduce Professor Russell Phillips. Russell was born on the 26th of June 1964 in a small town called Elam in the, in the Limpopo province. He went on to matriculate from Pretoria Boys High in 1982 and in 1983 started a national diploma at a former Port Elizabeth Technicon, now the Nelson Mandela University, where he also completed his national higher diploma. Since graduating, he worked at various companies, including the Ford Motor Company, Samcor, and also at Cell Air Ermelo. At Cell Air, he honed his skills as an aeronautical engineer, where he completed the systems design of a six seat composite aircraft and supervised the team responsible for the construction thereof. He then came back to the friendly city in 1991 and joined the former Port Elizabeth Technicon as a lecturer in mechanical engineering. While a lecturer, he kept on studying and completed his, completed his Doctor of Technology in 2009. For his doctorate, he developed a reciprocating aerofoil wind energy harvester that also resulted in a patent. He was promoted to senior lecturer in 1996 and became an associate professor in 2014. As pointed out by the VC, the Golden Key and other lecturer awards <coughs> distinguishes Russell as an excellent teacher. During the less than two years I've worked with him, I've come to appreciate him as one of the top innovators in our faculty and at our university. In 2013, he was awarded the N N NMMU Innovation Award and in 2019, the DST Top IP Creator Award for this university. He holds six patents for various inventions in the fields of renewable energy, power supply systems, turbine arrangements, and the latest on a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. <coughs> I've looked at the titles of the postgraduate students he supervised. And it's very clear that he left his passion for innovation fingerprints on the lives and on the career and on the outputs of those students. What you might not know is that Russell is also a professional pilot, licensed with instrument, instructor, aerobatic, glider, drone, and test pilot ratings. He has clocked more than 3,600 hours in the air over the past 39 years and is an expert in designing, developing, and building amateur aircraft. So, VC and others, if you are looking for an experienced aeronautics engineer and test pilot to design and test your next custom-built aircraft, you have to look no further. If I'm not mistaken, and my calculations are correct, then this is your 30th year, 30th year at the Nelson Mandela University. And I can't think of a better way to celebrate this milestone than to invite um, Prof. Russell Phillips to present his inaugural address. His address will focus on achieving meaningful levels 
of de-urbanisation in Africa, particularly in remote rural areas, and how to solve two major challenges, namely internet connectivity and energy supply. Thank you, Lisa. Vice-Chancellor and my Dean, thank you so much for those kind words. I'm humbled very much by them. Thank you. And then more formally, Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellors, members of the Executive Management Committee, Executive Deans, colleagues, students and guests, thank you so much for your interest in this event. I will now commence with the lecture. My inaugural lecture follows a slightly different approach to most. Instead of simply showcasing past research efforts, I plan to present to you this evening what could be called a grand plan. The pieces of the puzzle that make up this so-called grand plan started to fall into place during the course of other research, one after the other, in an almost uncanny manner. And the positive possibilities that stem from the plan are, in my opinion, simply too good not to share with you this evening. The lecture will look at a few figures regarding world population trends, identify an opportunity, identify some challenges to make that opportunity a reality, then present some current engineering solutions to the identified challenges, and finally, present some possible future engineering concepts to further enhance the solution. The abstract of the lecture, which appears on the screen now, sums up the grand plan in just a few words. If you are watching this as a recording and have limited time, you're welcome to stop the video and read the abstract, which of course gives away the grand plan. If you're watching this live, then please rather stay with me for the next 30 minutes as I unpack its contents in a little more detail. The current world population is quoted to be around 7.7 .7 billion people. Whilst the number seems vast, so is the habitable area of the Earth's surface. Population densities per country range from a very low 10 persons per square kilometer to a relatively high but seemingly manageable figure of 800 persons per square kilometer. What must be remembered though is that these are country densities and they dilute the reality of what is actually happening in many cities. Dhaka in Bangladesh is an extreme example and is quoted as housing nearly 22 million people at a density as high as 44,000 people per square kilometer. Dhaka in Bangladesh. In Africa, there are also a number of densely populated cities. Unfortunately, all have a large proportion of their residents living in slum conditions too. Kinshasa at 16,700 persons per square kilometer, Lagos at 13,800, and our Johannesburg at 3,100 persons per square kilometer. Globally, the trend is towards increased urbanization, as suggested by the blue curve. A curve showing the rural population is also shown in red. Authors Ritchie and Rosa present a succinct summary regarding urbanization. More than 4 billion people live in urban areas globally. In 2007, the curves crossed and urban dwellers exceeded rural dwellers for the first time. Estimates on urban populations vary, mainly as a result of disagreements on the exact definition of an urban area and what this includes. Of importance for this lecture, however, is that just under one in three people in urban areas globally live in a slum household. For most of human history, populations lived in very low density rural settings. Urbanization is a trend unique to the past few centuries. 
by 2050, it is projected that more than two-thirds of the world population will live in urban areas. It's projected that close to 7 billion people will live in urban areas by 2050. People tend to migrate from rural to urban areas as they become richer. Living standards tend to be higher in urban areas. Now the last two points stand in stark contrast to the earlier points and seem to be contradictory. The final point in the previous summary suggests that urbanization generally results in improved living standards. Whilst this may well be true in developed nations, the African situation paints an entirely different picture as presented in the map displayed now, which indicates what percentage of urban dwellers live in slum conditions. It can be reasonably concluded, therefore, that urbanization in Africa generally results in large proportions of the population living in slum conditions. It stands to reason that if de-urbanization can be implemented, the quality of life of people in Africa could improve. A study conducted before the COVID-19 pandemic compared employees working remotely to employees working from a traditional office setting and concluded that the at-home workers were not only happier and less likely to quit, but also more productive. Another more recent study drew further conclusions as to which professions were best suited to remote work. These mostly included better educated and higher paid industries and professions. Certain professions that were previously only possible to conduct in a city could now plausibly be conducted from a rural location. Examples of such professions being accountant, attorney, lecturer, artist, designer, architect, computer scientist, media professional, and numerous others. At this point, I'm sure you are seeing that the so-called grand plan is to propose de-urbanization for certain professions. You may also rightly be wondering how moving professions away from a city could reduce urban slums. More than likely few, if any of the targeted professionals, are the ones living in slum conditions. So is this plan not perhaps flawed? Kapoor explains that in the context of India, de-urbanizing so-called white-collar workers led to rural job creation in sectors beyond just the traditional sector of rural employment, namely agriculture. It is reasonable to assume that a similar scenario is likely in the context of Africa. It is further assumed that de-urbanizing professionals will in time attract further de-urbanization of other workers as work opportunities are created. In recent times, the connectivity requirements within many of the listed and other professions has moved from being just a useful ancillary tool to now being a necessity. Without connectivity, the professions simply cannot be practiced. This new necessity forms such a pivotal role within these professions that wherever it is available, the profession can now plausibly be practiced. There is a caveat though. The connectivity must be stable, affordable, and fast. O'Halloran surveyed a thousand people working from home and found that nine out of 10 wasted more than 30 minutes a day due to unreliable internet connections. In a rural setting where wired or fiber connections may not be available, the situation is likely to be exasperated, leaving cellular connectivity as the only option. Large parts of Africa, unfortunately, lack cellular coverage, thereby rendering these areas unsuitable. Fortunately, when available, prices and quality of cellular connectivity has reached a viable level for most remote working needs. Verrill lists the low Earth orbit, or LEO operators, as OneWeb, SpaceX, and LEOSAT. The author states that the first two operators have implementation plans for launching hundreds and ultimately thousands of satellites into low Earth orbit. Making headlines of late are Elon Musk's grand SpaceX successes, 
showing promise for possible imminent, low-cost, low-latency, high-speed internet connectivity across the globe, even in the most rural, remote settings. The timing seems fortuitous, to say the least. The intricacies of how low Earth orbit satellites will work is beyond the scope of this lecture. However, apparently these satellites will orbit the planet at altitudes as low as 100 kilometers, putting them just above the Kármán line, according to McDowell, which incidentally is considered the boundary between the Earth's atmosphere and outer space. At such a low altitude, they will have quick orbital times, which will require inter-satellite switching for seamless data transfer. Importantly though, they will have low latency, as little as 20 milliseconds, thanks to their close proximity to Earth, which is in contrast to current geostationary satellites, which have to be orbited much higher and hence have latency issues when used for data transmission. Potentially, therefore, connectivity with the quality of a current city fiber connection may be possible in remote locations across the world, including Africa. Costs are predicted to be similar to current land-based offerings. The pandemic has forced many of us to become familiar with software such as Microsoft Teams and Zoom. Whilst these platforms have proved adequate, it is questionable whether they will carry sufficient appeal post-COVID to keep people working remotely. A 2015 study concluded that digital holography offers appealing features for 3D imaging applications and has the potential to become the ultimate 3D experience. The authors do add, though, that digital holography requires a very high data rate. The constraint of exceptionally high data rate requirements appear to preclude this technology from being implemented immediately. It does show promise, however, for improving the remote working experience as presented in this display. It is reasonable to assume that a technology such as digital holography, if perfected in time and supported by the necessary data requirements, could go a long way to promoting a continued remote work thrust due to the highly immersive, interactive experience it would offer. This is amazing. I can see you, I can hear you, and I'm currently in Los Angeles. Tonight we're running the world's first holographic event at, at a university. Thank you so much. It's incredible that I'm here as a hologram. We're running an event called Women in Tech, and because the theme is, is tech, we're going to use tech. So we're pioneering this new hologram technology, and we're going to have speakers um, beaming in from LA and from New York via hologram to participate in our event here. I want you to know with certainty that if you want to be part of the tech world, then you should be. The people appearing as holograms will be able to see the audience, take questions from the audience and interact with them as if they were really there. Knowing that the venture capital space can be like a boys club, can you give us some tips on how you've successfully secured funding? Making sure you really understand the person that you're talking to and why they should invest in your business. To have the kind of 3D effect of being able to speak to somebody, being able to interact with somebody, pretty amazing experience. Internet-based technologies, hologram-based technologies, in order to enhance the learning experience of our students. I was amazed. I couldn't expect like that level of engagement. I feel like this is Imperial 3.0 because if you look at the campus and our classes, they're super diverse. There's people from all different walks of life. But with this technology, you're basically expanding your reach and bringing in presence from people globally. I'm really excited to see what kind of opportunities come out of this gap that's been closed. But it felt exciting because as I was sitting up there and moderating, you could really see, oh, this is different. This is just us having a conversation and the technology has enabled us to have that in a really meaningful way. Assuming that basic human needs and connectivity are available at a rural and or remote site, there remains one major need without which remote habitation and working cannot be contemplated. This need is energy. The map suggests that the energy grid in Africa is sparse, 
meaning that an alternative energy supply is more than likely required by our proposed remote professional, unless they are fortunate enough to be located near a reliable, affordable grid connection point. Ardeen et al. state that in the African context, the electricity grid provides electricity access to only 38% of the people in Africa. A 2015 study highlighted the deurbanization constraint at that time as follows. Problems are factors such as limited energy resources, the high cost of energy, including alternative energy. This well-known image on the right was until recently rather academic in nature and of little importance to the man in the street. That is changing thanks to the lowering costs of photovoltaics and the realization of the potential that solar energy holds for Africa. The map presents data in a convenient format of kilowatt hours of energy produced daily and annually in relation to the installed capacity of PV. In simple terms, it tells one at a glance how much energy production one can expect for every kilowatt of PV modules installed. For those in the audience already making mental calculations, here are a few useful facts. A kilowatt of PV modules is approximately three two square meter modules, totaling a six square meter footprint. The current cost of one kilowatt of PV modules in South Africa is around 5,000 Rand. The current retail cost of normal grid electricity in our city is roughly two Rand per kilowatt hour. Along the Eastern Cape Coast, one can expect roughly 4.2 kilowatt hours of average daily production. In other words, roughly 8 Rand 40 worth of energy is produced per day from those three PV modules. That is an impressive 3,066 Rand per annum. Ironically, much of the installed PV globally is in regions with a poorer resource than that found in Africa. China, the European Union and the USA are currently the top three. This graph is self-explanatory and tells the fortuitous story regarding PV costs alluded to earlier. Current cost is given as 38 US cents per watt, which at current exchange rates converts to 5 Rand 33 per watt. Actual market prices are even lower, with some local offerings as low as 4 Rand 11 per watt at the moment. In terms of the fortuitous aligning of stars that this lecture focuses on, this graph is probably the most important in terms of technology costs as the batteries normally make up a large portion of the system cost. Thanks to the increasingly high volume production of lithium ion cells, the price has reached viable levels for the application about to be presented. Lithium ion batteries are currently the preferred batteries for use in energy storage systems rather than the traditional lead acid batteries. Due to their relatively long life of around 4,000 to 6,000 cycles and their ability to repeatedly be taken to higher depths of discharge without incurring damage. Assuming one cycle per day, lithium ion batteries could potentially last for 10 years or more. The essentials required to power a remote office and home are PV modules, these output electrical energy as direct current, DC, during daylight hours. Expected daily and annual yields can be obtained from the PV power potential maps presented earlier. For uninterrupted electricity supply during the day and for supply during the night, a battery storage system is necessary. Until recently, lead acid batteries were commonly used. However, their relatively short lifespan before replacement in comparison to lithium ion batteries, coupled with the reduction in lithium ion prices, has rendered the latter the current batteries of choice in most new installations. Household or office needs are typically for alternating current, AC. 
The inverter converts the DC current from the PV modules and or batteries to AC at the required voltage and frequency. In South Africa, typically 240 volts, 50 hertz. Then, to extract the full energy potential from the PV modules with a varying solar irradiation, an MPPT is required. Conveniently, this is now typically integral with the modern hybrid type inverter. These four components have seen major technological improvements of late, as well as cost reductions. It is likely that this trend will continue. In extreme cases of persistent cloudy weather and high energy usage, even a properly sized solar system will deplete its battery storage. In instances where power outages cannot be tolerated, a generator is required. This can, however, be seamlessly integrated into the system and automated. This is the layout of a typical modern solar power system using a hybrid inverter. The system is not designed to supply energy to the grid. Instead, it is intended to provide uninterrupted energy to a domestic or business environment. It can accept top-up energy from a generator or the grid, if available, when solar and battery levels are inadequate. While there is sunshine, the DC current from the PV modules is fed into the MPPT in the inverter. The inverter then supplies the various AC loads, shown here in blue, and simultaneously charges the batteries with DC current. Once the sun is set, energy is drawn from the batteries to supply the connected loads. If the batteries are depleted, energy is drawn from the generator or the grid if connected and if available. A useful feature in a modern hybrid inverter is the ability to control the energy flow during the day via an order of preference. For example, by selecting SBU, solar battery utility, the full load will be drawn from solar and only if inadequate will battery be used, followed by utility and generator. If inclement weather is forecast or load shedding is scheduled, the order could, for example, be changed to SUB so as to ensure that the batteries are adequately charged in time. Here are the various components displayed as images. The PV modules, the lithium ion battery packs, the inverter and max PowerPoint tracker, and the control software display. Correct sizing of the various components for the application is vital. Informed calculations need to be made based on accurate predicted solar yield at the site, as well as on planned consumption. The table presents actual data recorded during the lockdown period of an actual remote office slash home environment. My own, actually. The specifications of the system that produced this data are installed peak PV capacity 2.4 kilowatts, daily expected average PV yield 4.2 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak, total lithium ion battery storage 10.5 kilowatt hours. During the period tabulated above, I worked from home due to the COVID-19 pandemic, hence the data is representative of the needs of a typical remote office. The system also provided for other household needs such as lighting and refrigeration. Water heating was not provided by the system, but instead by solar water geysers. The latter would also be available for the proposed remote office proposed in this research. The energy deficit, shown in red, in the final seven months averaged approximately 4%. It is reasonable to assume that an additional 10% of PV capacity and an additional 10% of battery storage capacity should provide a conservative solution to address this deficit. The final proposed system is presented in the table and should offer a reliable remote office slash household solution without water heating for any area in Africa with a PV yield potential greater than or equal to 4.2 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak installed. The column on the far right lists the costs of the components as well as the total cost 
totaling around 120,000 Rand. The proposed remote working location may be located in a small town or village with reticulated water supply, or it may be located in a more rural setting, such as on agricultural land. If the latter is the case, it is likely that water for domestic use will need to be pumped from a water source. The Eastern Cape, and our city in particular, has played a leading role in research and development of three-phase variable speed, dry, VSD, solar pumping technology. It is understood that the unique needs for water pumping in large parts of South Africa, not serviced by the electrical grid, led to this pioneering work. The result is a recently developed high efficiency, cost effective solution that links directly between the solar modules and a standard readily available three phase AC water pump. There are no batteries and the system delivers water throughout the day with an output proportional to the solar irradiance. The timing of this offering together with the current record low PV price is seen as fortuitous to the remote work concept presented in this paper. The image shows a test installation employing the solar pumping technology just described. This installation was completed in September 2020 by the Nelson Mandela University Renewable Energy Research Group on a community site in the Northern Cape. The 11.88 kilowatt peak PV array consists of 36 330 watt multi-crystalline PV modules. The modules power a 5.5 kilowatt submersible pump through a 5.5 kilowatt three-phase VSD solar pump controller with maximum power point tracking. The pump delivers 350 liters per minute at a 43 meter head and will be adequate for the domestic and subsistence farming needs of the small community. The PV array is sized to ensure that full pumping capacity is attained for at least six hours per day in winter and significantly more in summer. The installation pictured would be adequate for the domestic needs of a remote located family and provide for their water needs for small scale subsistence farming if desired. If the latter were not required, smaller systems with four modules and a one and a half kilowatt controller and pump would suffice. Such a system is shown next. Additionally, solar pumping systems such as these can be used to provide the required water flow and pressure for desalination plants and filtration systems. So far, we have seen what is available in the way of solar equipment and what is likely to be available soon in the line of high-speed internet. Certain potential remote working locations in Africa fall within areas classified as hot, as can be seen on the Koppen Geiger classification map presented. Particularly in summer, office and other working spaces may require cooling. Conventional air conditioning is feasible, however, the solar system proposed earlier would require significant upscaling. Also, if the air conditioning system is required to run through the night, Further upscaling of the battery storage system would drive costs up significantly. The ability to cool and possibly heat spaces, produce and food viably and efficiently using solar power is appealing. Our research brought us to the realization that the water pumping systems described earlier possess the potential to supply the required energy without reducing their water delivery. The typical daily variation in solar irradiance is shown. To achieve full pumping power early in the day and to maintain it until late afternoon, PV pumping arrays are deliberately oversized. Whilst effective and not overly costly thanks to the current low cost of PV, this method results in a large percentage of the PV array being underutilized for much of the day. Our concept is to utilize this surplus energy for cooling. In the case of the solar pumping system described earlier and pictured here again, the PV array was sized at 11.88 kilowatts peak, whilst the maximum pump power was only 5.5 kilowatts. 
Hence, at midday, 6.38 kilowatts of energy is unused or effectively wasted. The proposed concept is to utilize this significant amount of energy to run a refrigeration unit capable of operating effectively on this varying available power. A suitable substance will be cooled during the period of available excess power. The substance will be held within an insulated vessel. When cooling is required for living spaces or food and produce, a suitable heat exchange process will take place between the space to be cooled and the cold substance. The proposed system holds two principal cost advantages over a conventional battery storage system running an air conditioner, namely A. It uses existing solar modules. B. It does not require battery storage. Research has commenced on the refrigeration system, selection of substance and the design of the heat exchange and storage process. If the concept proves to be successful, it would offer additional viability to the concept of remote work and living. Unlike in the city, the remote working and living professional might have access to some agricultural land and may wish to partake in part-time small-scale farming. A recent Renewable Energy Research Group doctoral student, James Sewell, investigated the possibility of low-cost solar-powered agricultural robots capable of performing repetitive menial farming tasks autonomously. A prototype was developed and is currently being refined. The robot uses a real-time deep learning database to identify crop and weeds. A low input user interface ensures ease of operation. The robot can be quickly retrofitted with various end effectors or tools for different tasks such as weeding, spraying, watering and even harvesting. The robot senses the type of end effector automatically, thereby further simplifying setup and operation. The low input user interface requires the operator to simply maneuver the robot to be over a representative example of the crop. It then learns what is crop using a vision-based system and deep learning. Once ready, it proceeds with the assigned task using a combination of GPS and intra-row vision-based navigation to execute the autonomous operation. Onboard batteries are charged by the solar module and when depleted, or when the solar irradiance is too low, the robot stops and waits until the batteries are adequately recharged. The low cost and ease of use are seen as key benefits of the robot, particularly for the small scale, time constrained farmer. In conclusion, the notion of leaving the city and relocating to a rural location and practicing one's profession from that location via remote connectivity may seem to be a bizarre prospect. However, it appears that it will soon be technically feasible and hence worthy of further consideration. Thank you. Russell, the kind of doffing of the cap apparently is the new normal. In normally we would have shook hands and given you a hug. But thank you so much for what you have presented to us this evening. And it's my privilege now to to offer some congratulatory words to you as well as to say some thanks. So Professor Russell Phillips, it is my privilege to congratulate you on a truly stimulating inaugural lecture. Not only did I learn a lot about energy and some of the various engineering aspects, but I learned a lot about Africa in the process. 
and I must say I'm almost embarrassed that I don't know enough about Africa. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and your grand plan for how we can turn around the fact that urbanization has resulted in more slum areas in our cities to actually de-urbanize um, populations again and to provide solutions in those areas as you demonstrated so ably. You've clearly demonstrated your depth of understanding and expertise related to the application of some of your work in various aspects of engineering and the renewable energy field. Um, and your work has such potential to improve the lives of so many different people in rural areas. So I look forward to seeing how this work is going to come to even greater fruition in the next couple of years. And in so doing, you will continue to promote Mandela University as being a un university in service of society. As the VC and the executive dean have also remarked, you really need to be congratulated for your outstanding all-round contribution as an academic at Nelson Mandela University. As you have excelled as a teacher, a researcher, and in commercializing some of your and your team's innovations. I know that your scholarly and applied innovative work in industry and your link to aviation in particular has attracted many students to our university. I work quite a bit on the access front and they always want to know wh where's the person that builds the planes. So thank you very much for being that sort of person that attracts students to our university. I would now also like to take the opportunity to re relay a message to you from the president of our alumni association. And this is what he wrote. Dear Professor Phillips, congratulations on your inaugural lecture. The alumni association is proud of your academic journey and your association with Nelson Mandela University. To mark this very special occasion, please accept a small gift from the association. And I'm going to just hand that over to you. There's a couple of goodies in here for you. Great. Um, and our, our president of the association, Mr. Kwezi Blos, say, um, says that he looks forward to future interactions with you. So in closing, I'd also like to convey our thanks to those who have attended this inaugural lecture virtually. Your interest in Prof. Phillips' work and that of Nelson Mandela University is much appreciated. Thanks to our VC, Prof. Mutwa, for welcoming everyone and to Professor Van Weyck, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, the Built Environment and Technology, for introducing Prof. Russell Phillips to us. Last, but by no means least, thanks to the institutional governance team in the office of our registrar, our communications and marketing team, and our ICT team, that made the virtual inaugural lecture, lecture possible. You did a fantastic job. This brings to a close the inaugural lecture of Professor Russell Phillips. <laughs>